Today I'm going to talk about actually uh, seizure detection devices, what's available, what are the pros and cons, what do we know about them, and then <clears throat> a separate topic they've asked me to talk about is sudden unexpected death in epilepsy or SUDEP. One thing I just want to, a little disclaimer here at the beginning, I will talk about several different devices which are currently available on the market. Uh, but this does not constitute endorsement of any specific product. I will talk about pros and cons about each product and what we know about them, however. Okay, so seizure detection. Why is this important? Well, it can be very helpful for us as clinicians and for patients and families to know whether a specific treatment is working or not. Are there more seizures than we thought were actually occurring, for example? So that's a very, very important thing. It can also, of course, the, the main purpose is to detect seizures and to alert a caregiver that a seizure is occurring. So that increases the person's safety during a seizure, particularly if there's a fall or potential for injury during the seizure. Um, and, the, and there can be somebody there for the person if there's repetitive seizures. So it's a very good thing in terms of increasing the safety. Okay. So we talked about it can in reduce injury. Potentially also, if you know about seizures, you know about seizure clusters, a caretaker might be able to reduce the duration of a seizure by giving an emergency dose of medication or to prevent a cluster of seizures. Say somebody who typically has uh, clusters of three seizures, if they have one, if an emergency medication can be given after the first seizure, sometimes you can interrupt that cycle and prevent that cluster of seizures. Um, and then these kinds of devices can be linked to automatic therapy for seizures. And perhaps I think in the first talk you had some discussion about uh, some of the newer devices available for the treatment of epilepsy. And some of those actually do link the automatic detection of seizures to automated delivery of treatment. Um, and there's, this is a really exciting field, and I think this will just expand in the future uh, to other potential modalities, not just brain stimulation or vagal nerve stimulation, but other things, uh, maybe even automated medication treatment. Those are things in the pipeline for the future. And a big one in terms of why this has become very important in the field of SUDEP, or Sudden Unexpected Death and Epilepsy Research, is could these devices maybe reduce the risk of death from seizures? And we'll talk about that later. Okay, so what kinds of technology are out there? So everyone is probably familiar with the, the top one, the EEG. So that's our standard, it's our gold standard to know whether somebody's having a seizure. So the wires on the head like this young girl um, tell us if the person is having specific types of seizures. Now, it's not, it's even EEG, though it is the best thing that we have, a scalp EEG does not detect 100% of seizures. But it is very good, and it certainly can affect, it can detect with a, a very great sensitivity seizures with loss of awareness or convulsive seizures. So that's a very good modality. Um, but of course, as you know, an EEG requires multiple wires on the head and they have to stay in place. The brain is complex. We can't just put one little wire on the head and know if somebody's having a seizure. But we'll talk about the pros and cons of that and in what circumstances technology of that type can be helpful. Uh, we know that the heart rate changes during seizures. Actually, in the vast majority of seizures, the, there's an increase in the heart rate. Rarely there can be decreases in the heart rate or abnormal rhythms during seizures. And so we know that cardiac monitoring or heart rate and heart rhythm monitoring can actually be helpful in detection of seizures and has been incorporated into the new, uh, one of the new devices that uh, you probably just heard about uh, that gives automated uh, treatment for seizures. And then uh, there's other things like electrodermal uh, changes that occur in the skin uh, during seizures. And this is, a, again, a very exciting area of research and technology, uh, if you can detect the electrical, dermal, electrical changes in the skin that are associated with seizures, could that help to detect seizures, to alert a caregiver, to let someone know that something is happening? Um, and there's actually a device that will soon be available to detect that. 
In terms of other technology, a big one and of the currently available devices are, are the accelerometers. And those are basically motion detectors. But not motion detectors just, say, to detect somebody writing or doing something that's a normal activity like cooking. We don't want devices that, that show that somebody's just moving their arm. We want a device that's more specific for seizures. So accelerometers look for specific muscle and movement changes that are more associated with specifically with seizures. At this point, the technology is focused on generalized tonic-clonic or convulsive seizures because those have a very specific muscle pattern uh, where people stiffen and there's a phase of, of what's called the tonic phase where people stiffen and then that's followed by jerking. And it's a very specific type of pattern that can be seen. And these, so most of these devices have really focused on this uh, detection of generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Unfortunately, they're not so good at this point in detecting other types of seizures, like complex partial absence seizures, where people may be confused or just stare off, maybe lip smack, but not really move very much, okay? But I'll talk specifically more about that. Um, and then, of course, there's the old-fashioned audiovisual devices, uh, which can be helpful, especially if somebody vocalizes during a seizure or if there's nighttime seizures. Okay, so first of all, what are accelerometers? I talked to you about their motion detectors. They're generally worn on the wrist or leg, or they can use something like a cell phone. They unfortunately have, lim we have limited research on these devices so far, uh, but, and they are best at detecting convulsive seizures. But they can alert a caregiver. There are many companies that are making devices at this point. Costs, unfortunately, can be quite high, and I will talk a little bit about that as well. But there are some free apps available, too. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about this device, which is the smart monitor. It's worn on the wrist. It alerts caretakers if a seizure occurs. And again, this is a convulsive seizure, not a complex partial or any other type of seizure. It uses Bluetooth technology and alerts a caregiver by a cell phone, a, a smartphone. And then the smartphone automatically alerts your designated caregiver or caregivers in some case. You can sometimes alert one person or a group of people. And as I mentioned, it really detects the shaking of the convulsive seizure. There are sometimes, uh, so different devices have different uh, features. This one does have a medication reminder. It also has a get help button. So you can press it if you think, like say you have an aura before a seizure and you feel like you need to get help. You can press a button and it will automatically alert your assigned caregiver that a seizure may be about to occur. There's, this is also GPS enabled so that if, say, the person is alone, maybe outside of their home, it can alert a caregiver and also give information about where the person is. It records, it records the date and the duration of the seizure. And for those individuals who are just about to exercise, you can snooze the device so that uh, it won't go off if you're just about to do some jogging or something, okay? As far as the cost, it is expensive. So it depends on the device. This is from their website. And this one shows two of their devices. And you can see that there's um, different things that are available. It, it does, uh, somehow it didn't come out with uh, which one had which, you know, they had dots on the, uh, the actual, if you go to the actual website, which I put the, I think I put the website uh, information there, you, it'll tell you which one, the silver or the gold, which one has each of those options. So uh, as you can see, the cost is, is about $200. There's an activation fee, and then there's also a monthly subscription fee. So it can be expensive to have a device like this, but there are certain things that can be helpful. Like I said, the get help uh, uh, with the push of a button. There's an event diary and log, so a seizure log. Um, it, you can alert either to one person or to multiple people, depending on the type of device. And, and uh, the medication reminders, those are all very nice features. So what are the date, data regarding how useful is this and how effective is this? So I mentioned that with all these devices, they're really, unfortunately, pretty limited research. But this one uh, did have a study that was done in 15 children who were admitted to an epilepsy monitoring unit for their clinical diagnosis, not specifically for this, this uh, study. 
and they recorded convulsive seizures. The children wore the smart monitor watch, and they found that, so in this uh, particular study, there were, let me just see, okay, so 15 participants. They were three to 17 years of age, had a very good sensitivity. In fact, seven out of seven of the convulsive seizures were accurately detected. There was one false positive, so it detected something as a seizure, but it was just a movement that the person had, okay? So obviously this is very limited. I mean, seven out of only, you know, seven out of seven seizures, that's good, uh, but of course it would be nice to have larger numbers, and of course to know uh, in different activities that there's not a high false alarm rate. You know, people in this unit, in this study were hospitalized, so they were mainly in bed or sitting in the chair or something like that, so they weren't really up and about. So <clears throat> again, for this device, what kind of data can you get? Well, this is interesting. So they um, actually look at, you can see each, each event is numbered. It tells you what happened, tells you how long, and then you get actually uh, in the time um, and the date, and then it gives us a little graph as to what the motion looked like. And this is really more a muscle detection kind of um, uh, uh, tracing. So in this case, you could see that there's this sudden change and in increase in muscle activity. That's what you'd see with the tonic phase of a seizure with the stiffening part of the seizure. And this kind of tracing uh, here, you'd see with jerking, okay? All right, so what else is there? There's the EpiCare free device, and this is an armband. It's actually worn on the wrist, and it has two parts. It has this and then a control device, and they do have to be within 20 meters of each, each other. Uh, but this device can alert, again, similarly to the, uh, the last device, um, a caregiver via smartphone that, some, uh, that the person is having a seizure. And, and this one also has some clinical trial data. Uh, there were 20 patients who were studied in an epilepsy monitoring unit, and they had 39 generalized tonic-clonic seizures, or definite seizures that were, were, were de clearly recorded on video and EG, so 100% they were seizures. And it was able to detect most of them, almost 90% of the seizures. It did have a false positive rate of saying that there were 0.2 more seizures per day than there actually were. Um, and it has, it seems to be better when the person is at least 10 years of age. To, if, if, the, if it's a small child, uh, the amount of muscle activity was n not enough. It, it doesn't appear to be enough to really activate this device. But it is expensive, it's $1,500. So there's the website information about that. And this is actually one of the published studies about this device, and it does, um, so this was a, a nice study which did show that it had a good uh, sensitivity for picking up seizures. So almost 90% of seizures were, were picked up accurately. Other devices, this is the Brain Sentinel. This is actually not currently available, but it is undergoing US trials, and it is another device which is worn on the, the arm. Actually, it's worn up on the upper arm and it's being tested in epilepsy monitoring units, again, really to look for convulsive seizures. And we've been involved in some of these trials, but we do not, the data is not available yet regarding how specific and sensitive this device is. Um, so here, you may be more interested in something that's free, of course, I, who, who wouldn't be? Um, so there is a, a free app. Uh, this is available, this is a beta version, so it's still in testing. And it works on most Android or Windows uh, phones that support accelerometer applications. And if you go to their website, they actually have information, they have a list of which phones seem to be compatible. Um, but you can uh, download this uh, and uh, it, it has, it, it is based on the cell phone, of course. So the cell phone has to be worn in the pocket or it has to be on a belt in order to de detect the seizure. And again, it's better in the convulsive seizures. And this one is interesting. It was developed by a, a father uh, who has a son who has epilepsy and it was hospitalized multiple times because of seizures. And he wished there were some device that could help detect seizures. So he helped to actually make this, this app available. Uh, but it's still in testing mode. 
uh, but it is still available as a free device. It detects the seizure, it alerts a caregiver, and then you're supposed to turn off either the person after he or she recovers after the seizure can turn off the device, the alarm, or uh, when somebody comes to help can turn off the uh, alarm part of it. Okay, and it is also GPS enabled so that if the person is not with the caregiver, uh, others can help to, it can locate where the person is. Okay. All right. Um, and with that one, I should say that that one has not gone through clinical trials. We do not know how sensitive or specific uh, this, this device is. But I did look at the web, I did look at the uh, reviews. I was just curious, what do people think? And, um, you know, people had varying things. Uh, one person wrote that uh, it was very effective not only for convulsive seizures, but for, for drop seizures, for tonic seizures. So that was interesting to hear. Um, also, but other people said that they had trouble getting it downloaded on their phone or wasn't compatible with their phone or that they don't really have convulsive seizures, so it wasn't very helpful. So, you know, it depends on your specific situation. Here's another app. This one is available for the iPhone or Apple Watch. Um, and it sends a request for help when seizures occur. It does have a seizure log. And there's an alert via text, email, phone, and has GPS coordinates available. And it is available on the Apple Store, OK? Um, now this one, they are still, again, this one is also under development. It is currently free, but there is some uh, information stating that they will probably end up charging some monthly fee at some point for this, okay? But they're still refining this. This is, a, again, to detect convulsive seizures. So what other devices are there? So there's a mattress monitor, this MP5 mattress monitor, and this has also undergone a clinical trial. And it was effective in picking up about 60% of convulsive seizures and had about a 90% specificity. That is, when it, when it alarmed, it was pretty, pretty uh, clearly correlated to a seizure. Uh, most of the time, it was a convulsive seizure. But there were false, false alarms with that, too. And that was tested also in an epilepsy monitoring unit. Um, and then there, and that, that's the website. Uh, that's in a UK company. There's another device called the MFIT Movement Monitor. So these two devices are more for sleep-related seizures, okay? Of course, there's video audio monitors, and with actually any of these devices, there are some questions that, that uh, should, you should ask yourself and maybe discuss as a, if you're the caregiver or with the person, or if you're the person with epilepsy. These are concerns that, that, that anybody should have. Of course, how about the false alarms? There are false alarms with all of these products. But what would you do about it? Could it increase anxiety to get a whole bunch of false alarms um, and actually you know, cause patient fatigue or caregiver fatigue if there's too many false alarms? Um, there are independence and uh, privacy issues as well. Uh, many people don't want, you know, especially a teenager who's trying to gain independence, and then suddenly they're being monitored all the time with some device, and they feel you know, there's too much control from the parents or whatever. I mean, those are things that have to be discussed with all of these devices. All right, so the MFIT seizure detection, it is to detect seizures in sleep. And it consists of this bed sensor and then this bedside monitor. And it triggers the continuous faster movement. Uh, and it, there you can, over a preset period of time, it alerts a caregiver. And it does detect small movements, so it can be used in children, as opposed to a previous device, which I mentioned, which was really only for 10 years plus. And again, it's not cheap. It's almost $600, and that is the uh, website. Another device is the Embrace. This will be available. It's, it's set to be available next month. And this one is different from the others. This is not an accelerometer, but this is the electrodermal response, uh, the skin electrical changes in the skin uh, device. So what, uh, what's so great about that, or what could be potentially good about this? So it, it, there are skin changes during seizures, during convulsive seizures, and so this device is also marketed towards mainly the convulsive seizures, but there are also skin changes that occur during complex partial seizures, so other types of seizures. And so though it hasn't been evaluated fully, there are trials looking at this in complex partial seizures. 
Um, it might be helpful in other types of seizures as well. Uh, so again, the price is not cheap, and it, is, it should be available soon. Okay, so we talked about some of the high-tech new devices that are available. How about old technology, EEG technology? Like I said, it's still our gold standard, um, and it proves whether something is a seizure or not. And this can be useful, you know, even, we, again, we don't have, unfortunately, at this point, long-term EEG monitoring devices that people can wear for weeks or months, uh, except for very specific devices with uh, intracranial monitoring, that is, you know, inside with surgery on top of uh, certain brain tissue. Um, this is for uh, the detection of, 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 e of seizures usually during a short period of time. So 24 to 48 hours would be typical in terms of how long somebody would wear it. But it can be very, very helpful if there's a question as to whether somebody's having seizures, particularly at nighttime, or if they live by themselves and they're not aware of all their seizures. And we often do pick up seizures that people were not aware of, uh, you know, in their sleep or whatever. And then that can be very helpful to us to figure out what to do and how we can target the seizures and, and what treatment changes we could do. So that can be very helpful. There are, there is someone who is looking at maybe a skin patch type of long-term monitoring for EG, um, but that's not available. We'll see what happens and hopefully that, that was something that will come to fruition. Okay, so future directions. So we definitely need more studies evaluating this type of technology. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, could it be automated to deliver a specific treatment? That would be great. We need lower costs. Insurance approval would be one wonderful as well. Okay, so if you're considering a device, what to, what to think about? Well, how effective, how durable is it? What data supports its use? So we talked a little bit about the, some of the data. The costs, including monthly subscription, does insurance cover the device? And I'm not aware of insurance definitely covering any of these devices, though I've heard that people have written letters and, and that sometimes appeals to, to insurance companies with the support of the physician uh, could help to, cost, uh, to cover some of the costs. Is there a seizure log on the device? That's helpful. And how does it alert the person, the caregiver? And how many people can you alert? Do you want one person? Do you want three people alerted? And is it GPS enabled? Um, and the things to ask your doctor when you're considering this, how would you, would, would knowing about the seizures affect the management of the, seizure, of, of the epilepsy overall? In most cases, I'd say yes, that would, be, that would be something that would be very useful for everyone to know. It can help in planning seizure cluster treatment if somebody does have seizure clusters. And then, of course, we talked about maybe trying to appeal for insurance support if, uh, if, if the device is available and helpful for somebody. So that, I'm going to sort of change topics a little bit. Um, and uh, this, I'm going to talk a little, the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about SUDEP, which is sudden unexpected death and epilepsy. And, the, and why have these two topics been linked together? Um, the reason is because we think that, of course, improving seizure control and detecting seizures the best way that we can, can reduce the risk of, of death and injury related to seizures. So SUDEP is a sudden, unexpected, uh, witness or unwitness, non-traumatic and non-drowning death in epilepsy. And the definite SUDEP means that uh, some, a death has occurred and uh, the autopsy actually does not show any specific cause of death. Now, what, things to remember about it, it fortunately affects only a small percentage of people with epilepsy. But it is about, it's almost about, uh, it's actually about a little more than one in a thousand people with epilepsy do die to this. It is a major cause of death for people with epilepsy. But most people with epilepsy will not die due to SUDEP. There are people who are in higher risk categories, and we do know that having uncontrolled, particularly convulsive seizures, can increase the risk for this. So what causes it? We don't, the reason why we call it SUDEP is because we don't really know what causes it. It's really not completely clear. We do know that in most cases, a seizure seems to trigger changes in the body, particularly in the heart and the lungs, that eventually lead to death. Uh, so we know that seizures can affect uh, heart rhythm, uh, the heart rhythm and rate, and there can be breathing difficulties associated with seizures. There's brain dysfunction after seizures occur, and we think that the, there's sort of a contribution of all of these things. So the brain, of course, is fed by 
oxygenated blood from the heart and the lungs. So th this is very important. This, this whole network is very important for uh, normal functioning of the brain. And we think that there may be some genetic influence in some individuals. The effects of having long-standing uh, uncontrolled seizures, the precipitating seizure seems to be the trigger for most people, uh, that there's then, uh, what's, this means problems with breathing or lack of oxygen, uh, heart rhythm problems, and then brain dysfunction. There may be some unknown factors, lack, lack of supervision, um, and maybe related to drug treatment. But those all, there's questions about all of these potentially contributing to death. We do know there's certain things that have been associated with higher risk for SUDEP, having frequent uncontrolled generalized tonic clonic or grand mal seizures, particularly when they occur in sleep. Maybe sleeping on the stomach actually may be a higher risk. So there are people that like to, to sleep on their stomach. And the reason is that if they do have a seizure in their sleep, we think there's a higher risk that they could suffocate in the pillow uh, because the seizure will occur, and then the, the face could actually go into the pillow. Of course, not taking or missing seizure medications has been reported in many, many cases. And alcohol use has also been reported in many cases. So what can we do to reduce the risk for, for SUDEP or what has been associated with reduced risk, controlling convulsive seizures? If people that have only absence seizures, just blank, blanking out seizures, seem to very, be very low risk for SUDEP. Good medication compliance reduces risk. There's some data to suggest that maybe supervision during a seizure can reduce the risk of SUDEP. Uh, and perhaps, uh, this is still a big question mark, but there's, and it's sort of uh, complicated to, to relate all the data supporting this, but um, it's thought that it gentle stimulation, not, not aggressive stimulation after seizure, to promote good breathing after particularly a convulsive seizure may help uh, to enable the person to get back to a normal breathing pattern after a seizure, and that might reduce a risk for SUDEP. Maybe preventing seizure clusters. And then for people who have refractory epilepsy, that is seizures that are not controlled, despite trials of different medications, epilepsy surgery can actually reduce the risk for SUDEP when it is effective. So what can we do now to re reduce the risk? We, there's still a lot of unknowns about SUDEP, but there are things that we, we can do now. So strict medication compliance, get seizures under the best control possible using medication or surgery or combination or whatever treatment seems to help. It's very nice for caregivers to learn seizure first aid, I think it's very important, and CPR. Um, and look for possible nighttime seizures. As I mentioned, those have been associated with increased risk for this. And then if you are given the opportunity to participate in research evaluating for risk factors for SUDEP, I would encourage you to do so. It may not help you specifically, but it may help many people in the future. Um, so <clears throat> sleeping on the back or side, could that be helpful? We don't know. But like I said, sleeping on the stomach, there's some concern that that could increase the risk for um, suffocation with a seizure. I mentioned the gentle stimulation, avoiding excessive alcohol and drugs, because that could be excessively sedating and may uh, impair somebody's normal ability to, to uh, as a safety kind of uh, response that the body normally has after a seizure. There's questions, I put this in here just because many people have asked about this anti-suffocation pillow. Um, and here's a picture of it. Uh, it's a special type of pillow that seems to increase the airflow. This has not been proven to decrease the risk of death in any situation, but uh, you know, there's theoretically wonder, could this improve ventilation or uh, breathing and oxygenation after seizure? Oh, it didn't come out very well, but there is a, a, there's a website there. It's a UK website, and it's not cheap, $120. So preventing seizure clusters. And then, as I mentioned, knowing first aid for seizures. And if you go to the Epilepsy Foundation website, they actually have all this information. I got this from the website. Um, in terms of what to do after a seizure to help uh, your, uh, your, someone, your loved one, okay? So future directions, oh, sorry, one thing didn't come out on this, but um, the, uh, so collaborative research, SUDEP registries, that is uh, that's something that we're doing in academic institutions to try to figure out 
you know, what is happening to people with, uh, who die, unfortunately, due to SUDEP. But also, we, family members are directly encouraged to contact the registries about someone who has died, unfortunately, due to SUDEP. There are multi-center studies that are now ongoing. It's the first time that we've had this really big multi-center study. There's now 14 centers in the UK and the United States, but primarily the United States. It's funded by the NIH, and that is the uh, Center for SUDEP Research. Um, and Jefferson is one of the sites. Um, and basically, we are asking all patients who are admitted to our epilepsy monitor unit to consider participation in this. And we look at seizures and what happens to the heart rate, and breathing, um, and also take some blood samples for genetic studies. Um, and we hope that in this process, it's a multi-year study, that we will find out more information and, and reduce deaths re related to SUDEP. And then we talked about the seizure detection devices, and there are a, there are a number of studies looking at how that may play a role in reducing uh, risk of injury as well as death. And patient education is so important, and I know that's why you're here today, of course, um, but it, need to have some discussion of the risk for SUDEP and, and optimize seizure control using whatever methods uh, are available. I'm sorry, the one thing that didn't show up, which is very important, which is the SUDEP Institute uh, with the Epilepsy Foundation. Uh, that is available. You can find that link through the Epilepsy Foundation website as well. Okay, so that covers everything that I was going to talk about today. Well, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. May.